Hello and welcome to the Black Dog number 283. Ah, yeah. yes. Yay, Mr. L, he's in the house. Still not 300. Still not 300, no. Not 300 by a long chalk. And I'm just checking to see whether or not we're recording. Yes, we are. Brilliant. Fantastic. <laughs> That's always a good start. Anyway, um, so yes, episode 283. I'm Lee. I'm Darren. I'm Jim. And I am Elton. And this week we see the start of Man Blub Month. <laughs> so, so, so only. <laughs> oh, I've got a big packet of tissues right here. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wait a minute. It's Man Blub Month, not Porn Month. No, I was going to say, what, what do you need those tissues for? So we're going to have a bit of a chat. Um, then we're going to see how everyone's week's been. And then we're going to have a shitty superhero and a Profanosaurus. Oh, yes. And then we're on to the first of Man Blood Month, which happens to be uh, Jim's choice, which is the Elephant Man. So there you go. So, I guess, I guess no further ado. Oh, by the way, yes, we do have a new intro, and that is our permanent intro. Hope you like it. Let us know what you think of it. Um, We didn't do anything to it. All we did was just nick it. (laughs) <laughs> I think we should be up front with that. <laughs> anyway. Still did it. Yeah. So, um, yes. So, let's let's get on. So, how's everyone's week? So, we'll start with um, you, Elton. How's your week been? Uh, it's quite boring, really. But I did manage to get around to watching two films. Mm-hmm. And I went on a little adventure. Um, okay. So, not so boring, then. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's not that great. Um, the two films I've seen, one I have seen before and one I haven't seen before. Okay. Uh, the one I have seen before is Triangle. Oh, right. Okay. This I, is, yep. Kate O'Mara. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, not the BBC shipping line um, <laughs> soap opera, is it? <laughs> or is that, no, that that's Howard's Way, isn't it? I think so, yeah. It's, it's a chunky Aaron Nets, Nets and stuff like that. Okay, well, go on, go on, go on. <laughs> Obviously, we aren't talking about that triangle, but we're going to run with that joke, so carry on. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I first time I watched Triangle, I was nonplussed by it. Uh, I, I wasn't impressed. I'd heard good reviews about it. And I think this time round, I'm decided I don't like it. It's a time travel movie I don't like. Um, wow. Okay. I'm a bit gutted about that. But I'm glad I've decided that that is in the books now. So okay. I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, okay. The other film I watched, what was it? <gasps> there Will Be Blood. Ah, uh-huh. I drink your milkshake. Oh, it's so good. Isn't it? Yeah, man. Why, why doesn't people tell me to watch these things? I don't know. We're it's trying crazy to. Enough. We're trying to do this. <laughs> We've got an educating Elton season coming up soon. Don't worry. We're on the case. Yeah, I've I don't know why I haven't watched this. This is right up my alley. I've seen the cover many, many times in HMV when I'm looking around DVDs and CEX and I thought I I caught it for a quid in CEX. Mm. And I thought, oh, do you know what? Why not? Let's go buy myself something lovely. And so I did. And, um, yeah, it's bloody good, isn't it? Flip it it out. It's a great film. Yeah. Yeah. Paul Paul Thomas Anderson, if I'm not mistaken. Not Paul W.S. Anderson. It's a very, very, very distinct line between the two. (laughs) (laughs) Trust me. Um, Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm glad I've I've seen it now. Um, It was was on my radar for a long time, along with, uh, what was the other one I watched? Oh... No Country for Old Men. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, but did they come out at the same sort of time? More or less, actually, yeah. yeah. I seem to remember they were a big head-to-head in like the, all the uh, Oscars and other gongs that particular year. Right, okay. Yeah. 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 And I, I've just got around to seeing them both. So, yeah, it's good. Thumbs up from me, definitely. I, I flipping love that, and I'm going to be watching it again very soon. Um, mm. everyone, when, when I put it on Facebook, everyone started chiming in and putting on catchphrases and stuff like that and quotes yeah. and stuff. And I was like, okay, I, I don't know. what. Why is he talking about a milkshake? What the fuck is all this about? <laughs> My it's milkshake about... brings all the boys to the yard. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> it's better than yours. But flipping hell, man. There's points where it's grim as well. But f- Oh, yeah. It, it's, that. yeah, I'm well impressed with that. That is perfectly up my alley. I love mm. it. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thumbs up from me. 
Cool. Um, and your little adventure? Uh, yeah, Kimmy wanted to do Pokemon Go. <clears throat> yeah, okay. I've got something on that. Carry on. Oh, well, I, I, I was intrigued by it. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to take the piss. And I'm quite happy to learn as well. Mm. And I'd rather learn and then take the piss once I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And it seems to be a game where I want to steer clear because I know my OCD of these sort of things where I need to catch everything. <laughs> um, I, I found this out when I was playing Lego games mm. and on the PlayStation 3, I think it was, and a Batman Lego game. And I just had to break every single block. Mm-hmm. Because there's there's coins and stuff to collect, mm, yeah. and I know this will be exactly the same thing. So what I'm doing, I'm trying to keep it out of my hands. Uh, walk around the village with her, and just catch the stuff. It's it's quite good fun. I, I quite enjoyed what I did. Uh, I was also yeah. doing it today while uh, we were at Jacob's football match, uh, yeah. football training, mm. and we were walking around the park, and I was just helping her out. But yeah, then then you get some dickhead kids around about maybe 10 or 11 uh, being sarcastic and gobby around us about catching Pokemon and if I had a shovel then they would all be in a pile um, probably burning at the moment but yeah. luckily I didn't have a shovel to dig their own graves wow. which Pokemon is which go. is but yeah but the thing is what's really funny is like I mean just to cut in but it's like when um, Lisa had a birthday on Saturday and we went to this restaurant. And by the way, if anyone can hear any noises in the air, air, air flying around and stuff from the outside, that's because it's hotter than a rat's ass in a wagon rut. It's just <laughs> fucking, <laughs> fucking hot. I'm yeah. glad you said that because I've got windows open as well. And, yeah, You're sweating more than... <clears throat> Yeah, I'm I'm swe- I'm sweating like Jimmy Savile at a court hearing. I really am. Oh, I was going to say Jimmy Savile in a polyester Santa suit at a kiddie's Christmas party, <laughs> but um... it works. It all works. The the, the 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 it can all be attributed to the same thing. Yeah. It's it's like Gary it's like Gary Glitter at a, <laughs> an extradition hearing. Anyway, and that was the time the Black Dog Podcast went down the drain. Like a Twinkie. Like, like a, a Twinkie. Twinkie. So, yeah. But, um, no, but on Saturday, so so my, I'm trying to explain it to my parents because Katie's got it. And basically trying to explain it to my parents. And then as we were walking, it was weird. It was like Invasion of the Body Snatchers because it was like we walked past like four people just on the way to the to the car park, which is about mm. 100 yards. And you could see people sort of waving their cameras about and phones about. And um, I said, he's playing it. She's playing it. That kid over there is playing it. And my dad's like, what is going on? You know, it's like kind of really kind of one of those kind of it suddenly stopped being in the news and suddenly it'd be right in front of him. Shares have gone through the roof of Nintendo now. Yeah, the, I, know. Uh, I think it's Niantic, not Nintendo. No, They've doubled, haven't they? Doubled, yeah. Yeah. But um, no, so yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll get to my own little thing with that. But basically, yeah, it's it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was uh, at work uh, today um, and... It was it was baking hot, and I was uh, sat down having a drink, and you could see herds of people with their phones out mm. doing this, mm. and there were swarms of people. It was more people around than Flying Ant Day. <laughs> it, it, was, it was crazy, and they were just walking up and down this high street, and you could straight away you could tell exactly who was doing it and who wasn't doing it. Yeah. And there are some people trying to style it out as well. There was oh, yeah. some guy that walked past us uh, today in the park mm. and he was pretending to talk on his phone. <laughs> <laughs> and when I saw him take his phone away, he had it on his phone. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, just trying to style it out as if, like, he's, no, dude, if you don't get embarrassed about it, just play it. I, I ain't got a problem with that no, whatsoever. No, absolutely. As long as there's no bullying about it, then that, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, well, that saves me getting around to my point in my bit, but because the thing is, I, I I've been a bit down on it on on the old Facebook recently, but I will say this right off the bat: I'm not down on it. I'm down on people basically flooding my Facebook wall <laughs> with it. You know, it's like it's like yeah, okay, you want to play a game? That's fine. We all do things. We all do things that other people don't understand. That's fine. I understand that. But when it first kicked off, 
it was like there were 75 posts. I literally had to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll until I got to my first moral outrage post. <laughs> you know, <laughs> before before I got to someone telling me that, that whatever politician had done whatever to whoever, I literally... I had to scroll for hours, and then it's like, and all I've got is pictures of d- badly drawn ducks on on <laughs> floors and pictures of spiky things. And it's like, I, I mean, I applaud the enthusiasm. I think it's amazing what it's doing. I think as a because because I was saying I was saying at work today, there's a thing. There was a thing we had a seminar at, um, cartoon years ago, like 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 good eight nine years ago, where someone actually turned around and said, you know. One of the things to really make anything popularize is to game your life. Essentially to make something that you do every day a game. Yeah. And this has cracked it. You're walking. You're walking to work. You're walking to wherever. And ta-da, you're playing a game. So suddenly it's not a, not walking anymore. It's playing a game. And so on that respect, I think fantastic. Hats off to the Nintendo. Hats off to... Pokemon people, Nantec or whatever they're called, I think amazing. But when it comes to my Facebook wall, I don't want to see six thousand pictures yeah. of floaty, spiky things. That's the problem, though. <laughs> they're not they're re- deliberately posting to your wall. You're getting the feeds from their wall. Okay, okay. Let's so let's it's p- like they yeah. can post what they like, but oh, it's yeah, just your yeah. your your catches net. You I thought you could have smacked me. In the Sorry, I wasn't the smacking you now for the microphone. No, I was just trying to move it shut closer up, to your mouth. On. Shut your fucking shut mouth. Shut your, shut your, shut your mouth. <laughs> Old man shouted, "Cloudamon." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. I should have that playing, shouldn't I? Really, but um, no. <laughs> It was. It's more the fact that it just. It suddenly became like it flooded, and and You've luckily, got purity though, haven't you? Fairly? Yeah. Well, that's what happened. I was so, going to say Facebook purity has sort of sorted that right out now. I wanted to get it for the phone. Hashtag Pokemon Go has just cleared it right up. But um, yeah, that's all I was going to say on that one. And yeah, you know, yeah go on, carry on. Well, I'm, I'm glad that Nintendo have done this because there was. Uh, I suppose they they were wiping off amounts of their shares by the dozen in recent years because of the, the Wii U and the Wii and stuff like that and the decline in Nintendo and the call for them to put apps on your phone, like putting Mario on the phone. Hands up who wouldn't download and put Mario on their phone straight away. I know I would. I'd pay a fiver for it right now to have it, mm. like the first Super Mario Brothers on there. Mm. And so I suppose they're waiting for that to press that red button in the future. They've still got that in hand now. But this has just brought Nintendo back to life. And I'm glad about that because not that I buy Nintendo products uh, per se, like the consoles, but I, I like their handheld stuff. And I, I like their quirky games like this. And yeah. I, I'm i not going to get into it because I, I do know my addictive personality on this sort of thing. So I'm going to steer clear of it. But I'm going to watch from afar and enjoy it as a, a father instead of a, a mm. gamer. So well, yeah. it's it's a different tact to take, I suppose. Yeah. I've actually tried it myself. Yeah? Yeah. I thought, right, let's give it a go. Mm. So downloaded it, it this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, it, it does actually. But downloaded it, put it on my phone this afternoon. Mm. I'm already within reach of doing the training stuff i've got a shit ton of pokemon it's just what happens is in my work i don't know there's some sort of magnetic field distortion that makes i'm sitting there looking at it i've got the i've got the sort of like you know the the um locator on and everything mm. and i'm watching my character just walking up and down the high street by That's itself because the gps is fucking yeah. shite and it's like this is great i don't even have to leave the office <laughs> yeah i'll have that one i'll have that one i'll have that one, one. That I'll one. Have that one. Well, actually, I can I can tell you what's really interesting is that you know that basically, if you go from King's Cross, you got St Pancras, King's King's Cross, yep. and then up to West uh, West Tram Sheds where I'm working at the moment. There's about seventeen, um, like landmarks. Yeah, where you get that, the poker balls. And so, so basically, essentially. The whole thing is a th- is a two kilometer round walk of pokey stops for people, <laughs> and you just see them just looping around. Yep. and it's like it's like wow, you know. Whereas whereas here, because Katie's got it, because whereas here, there's one, and it's at Grove Park Station. 
and it's like about a hundred rates. Yeah. And do you know what's really funny? There's all the gangs waiting no, no, around no. there with the clubs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no. Have a nice new phone, thank but you. But it was like we will. We will Warriors come, come out to play. play. <laughs> 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 yeah, but weirdly, my my closest one they're just down the road. It's the local pub near me. And it's just out of reach. I can't do it from my house. I've got shit tons. There's mm. one outside the door of my front door of my work. Well, there's one. <laughs> I actually just walked down and it's like there. Thank you. Well, I know for a fact there's one attached actually to the back wall of our office. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, because there's apparently some historical clock on the back of the shed. <laughs> Done. Because <laughs> that's where you find them. That's where you find them. Logical so shot. anyway, the thing was, I, was I believe s- the pokey stops are actually just the old, old just uh, ingress parts. If you know the in-game ingress. Oh yeah. Yeah, they say they're, 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 they're all in the same place. That's where they, <laughs> where they put them on. So yeah, points of interest, basically, mm. isn't it? There we go. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for that, Jim. Mm-hmm. There you go. See, <laughs> is there anything you don't know about? <laughs> you, are, you are our font of all knowledge. Education, education, education. Exactly. Anyway, so I was going to say, with not that I want to jump into my week, but essentially Katie was quite funny. Katie got it, and we were looking after the dog, and that dog was never more surprised than any of us when Katie got up and went, I'm going to take the dog for a walk. And it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> what? And she, suddenly she was gone. Are you drive off <laughs> me. Yeah. yeah, it's like, it's like you know, normally to sort of get Katie off of a sofa would usually require a crowbar, a blowtorch, and at least a trail of cake leading to the kitchen. <laughs> but But no. So like, it was like, even the dog was like, even the dog, you just see the look on her face like, what? <laughs> What's going you, on? You want you want to go f- go for a walk? Walk? It's it's eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, Elton, carry on, mate. Oh, that's it, mate. That's oh, it. right, okay, fair enough. Well then, Jim, over to you, sir. Uh, uh, this week I've been um, uh, mostly melting at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking right. I mean, yeah, same here. I am losing my body weight in moisture. I tell you that. Well, now, I mean, so I've been around the world. I've I've been through Death Valley in the height of summer. <laughs> I've been to the <laughs> tropics, but the thing is, when you get to those places, you you're in, going into buildings that have air conditioning. Mm. <laughs> Whereas, like this is kind of oh great, it's a it's those five days of the year where I really wish I had a huge fan <laughs> attached yeah. to the ceiling. <laughs> but knowing the British weather, it just isn't worth going and buying one. <laughs> Maybe if you bought one, because the instant I do it, it'll be it'll go snap back to winter quicker than you can say <laughs> snap back to winter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, then I've been uh, playing with my new tablet. Oh, yeah. Um, so I I heard some very interesting news which I'm sworn to secrecy about, which is not good for either you, me, or the listeners. So let's move on. Right. Okay. But it is very very interesting if it comes off. Oh, okay. <laughs> is it related but, uh, to yourself, sir? Or <clears throat> no, no, it's not. It's not. It's uh, from a friend who knows someone who works in an office block where something else is housed, and uh, has got some inside gossip about a project that may be coming to fruition. Man alive. I miss I miss being in visual effects I, I, where I could do the juicy danglers. Now you just now you, it's your turn. What's going on? <laughs> it's a polar flip that's happening. That's what it is. Yeah, exactly. The <laughs> magnetic magnetosphere going out the window. We have to get the thumb screws out very mm. soon. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, but that's sort of sort of tied to that kind of flipping of reality. I watched a very interesting movie from uh, I believe it's 1971 last night. Oh yes, um, that was. Uh, Produced by Peter Rogers, mm. and uh, if that name rings a bell, Carry it was On Peter Rogers. Yes, was the man behind the Carry On franchise. <laughs> so I was amazed to find this rather sort of done this sort of dark horror slash thriller slash dark drama movie called Revenge. Um, right. Also known as Terror, Terror in the Basement, and the Inn of the Frightened People <laughs> uh, in various other parts <laughs> of the world. Revenge is the better title. Yeah. Um, but it starts with a funeral of a family who just buried their daughter who was abducted and murdered. And um, by a local weirdo who's believed to have killed another local girl. And then after the funeral, the father of the, the first girl who was killed turns up mm. and says to dad, they've let him out, insufficient evidence. Oh. And so they hatch a plan to go and kidnap him and beat a confession out of him. <laughs> Nice. And 
I won't say that's just the, you know the basic premise. I won't say anymore because it um, it all goes horribly, horribly wrong. As as always, <laughs> it is. Um, it's a really kind of strange, offbeat and sort of dark film um, starring Joan Collins uh, as the mother, um, and it is really kind of. It's, it's a very obscure film I heard about in a podcast. Like, well, that sounds interesting. Well, this is a film that should be better known because it's it's a really interesting movie. It's kind of, mm. I know that kind of sounds kind of like, ooh, that sounds like almost proto sort of torture bomb. <laughs> but it really, so, you know, sort of explores kind of the corrosive kind of effect of trying to get revenge and <laughs> and how mm. it just really just screws everything and everybody involved up getting into this situation. Yeah. Does Kenneth uh, Williams appear at some point and go? No, Ooh. no, there's, there's no, no carry on regulars at all. Oh it's my just, word! I was just, it's just really bizarre. Going, I didn't know Peter Rogers had done anything other than carry on films, <laughs> and to have like you know uh, produced this movie that's sort of really kind of dark and uh, <laughs> dark and dramatic. It's nice. Kind of, well, really, I'll have to have a look at IMDb. What else has he done on the Quiet? Yeah, <laughs> when he wasn't doing carry ons. And, the, and except for the music, which goes da 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 da, da, da. <laughs> kind of ruins the mood. <laughs> ah, right. Anything else, sir? Uh, now nah, that'll do for okay, me. Okay, fair enough. Then, in which case, we move on to you, Mister Barnard. How are you? Yeah, all right. It's but, been a pretty uneventful week, really. Okay, well, my week. Sorry, <laughs> go on, carry on. I did go to the uh, Lambeth Country Fair. Yes, which was good. Got pissed out of your gold. Oh Jesus, yes. Saw Mr. Chessel. Yes. Christian Chessel. Yes. Um, along with Mr. Jones, Mr. Martin Jones and uh Miss Leslie Gold. Yes. Ah. As well. Right. She was there. Mm. Um no, Leslie wasn't. Sorry, no, what the fuck am I talking about? She wasn't she wasn't there at all. <laughs> oh, she wasn't she wasn't there Doing at all. Mushrooms. She was is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it something? I'm is just it, Captain it, Alzheimer's. I'm just gonna go <laughs> now. I'm just gonna go. Um, no, the only the only Jenna other thing. Marty, perhaps. Uh, no, Jenna Marty weren't there. They were actually there the next day. Oh right. Okay. So uh, Gemma's doing a book signing, I think, up up north. Okay. Up there. Um, but no, one of the things I did start watching this week was a show on Amazon, another Amazon pick mm. uh, called Roadies, <laughs> which is all about. Um, How do you find these things? No, it's it's one of the new ones that's come out. It's a, again, it's one of these shows like Preacher that gets released once a week. Right. Um, so it, they're into their fourth episode now. Mm. And it's a comedy about, of course, roadies on a, for a rock band. Mm. And they do actually have proper bands turn up oh, as right. a support band for this fictitious big band that these guys support. Yeah. And um, it's got um, Luke Wilson in it. You know, Owen Wilson's brother. Yeah, the lesser of the Wilsons. The lesser of the Wilsons. But no, he, he's very, very good in this. Yeah. Um, Timothy Spall, also uh, as well, who plays a a bloke who's trying to bring down the costs mm. that the band and sort of like, you know, they, they yeah. incur for mm. everything they do. Mm. And um, yeah, I, I highly recommend it. Right. It's, it's a very funny show. Yeah. Um, and I, I've just, I, I can't, I, I, I've, I've heard they're getting a second season. Right. Which is thumbs up. They nice. haven't even finished the first one yet, but um, cool. yeah, so looks good. Excellent. So that's Roadies, Amazon Roadies. Prime. Right, okay. That's the pick of the week for Amazon. Okay. That certainly is. Anything yes. else? Um, no, actually. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> Apart from melting <laughs> on that seat there. Yeah, exactly. I'm just dribbling away here. I'm I'm like that bloke from fucking X-Men, that senator that they capture and oh, turn yeah. into a mutant. I am literally <laughs> turning to jelly. <laughs> Yeah, um, my week. Well, I mean, I've already described a bit of it because there was that Pokemon Go stuff. Um, but um, also, we um, we had Lisa's birthday, which was nice. Um, and uh, yeah, then uh, yes, uh, on Sunday I went to see Ghostbusters. Aha! And I've got to say, I actually really quite liked it. Huzzah! I thought it was really rather good. It yeah. was a lot better than I was expecting. Because even when I was like sort of the saying, oh, you know, it could be good, it could be bad, it could be awful. It's it's got some problems. It's not perfect. It's not yeah. as good as it is. It should have been, if you know what I mean. Yeah, but it's it, still not shit. But it's not shit. No, not even close. It's got it's got some nice quotable lines. Every character is well fleshed out. 
it's got some funny moments. It's got some scary moments. There's a lovely mm. fall of the House of Usher at the beginning of it. It um, did make me jump. Mm. Um, the first sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't say anything because I know, I know, there. Jim, you're going to see it tomorrow, correct? That is right. Yes, tickets go. booked. Yeah. So to it. yeah, so it, it's better than it. It's better than than anyone would have you believe, and it's and it's, but it's not as good. It's not good enough to silence the the idiots who were down on it from the start. It doesn't matter if it, it could have been the best film ever, and they'll still be down on it. That's true, but at least you know, at least there would have been a sort of, you know, what I'm saying is, at least like there's that moment where you can sort of turn around and go, "Oh, shut up," you know, because. You know, like the you know the sort of Heath Ledger thing is we always come back to you know it's like everyone was down on it and then it's like oh <laughs> shut up you know but this is this is there's there are points where you feel like there's plots that have been cut out I still and I don't, can't yeah no, I, I, I'm just saying yeah. I'm just saying it's it's not it's not Personally, as it's not as tight and perfect as the fir- as the original and as long as that exists that's a problem as yeah, far but it's as not. For me personally, it's not the level that they brought it down. So no, it's, no, it's no, bloody no, well seen no. it yet. I mean, it's like on IMDb, it's sitting at like four point <laughs> five negative, you know, for votes, and it's like it's not. It's, be- be- it's better than the second one. But it's better than Ghostbusters two by a fucking mile. Yep, it certainly is. <laughs> I mean, you know, and that's got like seven point eight if you put any stock in any of these things anyway. But so for me, I was I I went in there with sort of medium to low expectations, and I came away thinking that was as good as it could have been. Probably could have been a lot better if they just stuck stuck with the script a bit and stick through to the very end of the credits. Yep, very end, because by the end you kind of left thinking, well, if they have a sequel, I'm down for that. But, yeah, um, well, it's been they're definitely getting one, apparently. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, otherwise, um, what else have I been doing? Um, I was I watched um, the first episode of something called Stranger Things on Netflix. What did you think? I'm not sure yet. I think I've got to watch a few more episodes. But at the moment, it seems a bit too much like... Um, it's like everyone's going for that... S- you know, has anyone? How much? How many of you guys have seen um, that film that was like a seventy, uh, like an eighties throwback? Um, the one with the um, Super Eight. No, not that one. It, well, it, yeah, there's Super Eight actually. That's not a bad one. Now, the one with um, Dan, what's it? Dan Stevens, and he was the he was the the guest. The guest. Yeah. You know the vibe of the guest where it yep. feels like it was a film It should made have been a John a... Carpenter's film. Exactly. Yeah. This feels like the same thing crossed with Super 8, crossed with the X-Files, but set in the 80s. Okay. And it start, and it's got all the bits are there, but right now, based on only one episode, so I can't really say... But based on one episode, it feels like one of those um, small town, weird places kind of sub genre, like um, Eerie Indiana. Yeah. And what's the other one? Um, there was American another, Gothic. Uh, American Gothic. Um, and there was another one, which is uh, like a town called Eureka. It's got that kind of weird small town America vibe. Oh, um, what's the other one? The one with Matt Dillon that was in it r- recently. Um, oh. Like a Wayward Pines or something like yeah. that. I think that's it. It's got that vibe as well and that sort of doesn't always float my boat you know where yeah. oh the guy down the street might know something oh the person around the corner might know something oh there's all mystery and strangeness in the town and we look at the way that man eats his Twix bar exactly there's obviously it's... a secret there exactly it's got a bit of Twin Peaksy kind of thing going on but really Super 8 and the X-Files is kind of its main touch bases right so but I'm looking forward to seeing the next couple of episodes. I just want some time to just basically blast a few out of the way. Yeah. But it's interesting. It's got it's got my attention. I just hope it doesn't go down that that full on. Oh, look, we're in a mysterious town with mysterious things happening, and everything's mysterious. Woo! But um, yeah, I can't really say much more than that, really, because it is a bit. Damon Lindelof, is it? It bloody ain't no. It's very much not. Ooh. But it's, it's yeah. But like I say, if you like that whole thing of emulating the eighties, yeah, it's good. It's got got a bit of a nice vibe to it in that respect. Hmm. 
Other than that, I am sweating so much that I think my arse crack has become a swimming pool. So, uh, <laughs> I think... Won't be doing any lengths in there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want any length. I don't want any length in that. No, at all. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> so, I'll tell you what, let's move on to our shitty superhero. Not cool at all. Great big bunch of losers going nowhere fast. Trying to fight bad guys, falling on their ass. Try to tell the stop. But they don't understand that we suffer Shitty heroes go away Yeah, yeah Still no bloody end No, (laughs) no ending No, not done it yet Too lazy, too bored, no Too hot Too hot yeah. Anyway, welcome to this week's shitty superheroes. Darren's already hitting the beer, so that's uh, that should prepare him nicely for the next one. Yep. This one was supplied to us by Doreen Kelly. Um, she sent us two, and I've picked the second one that she sent us. Um, I'll just read this one out. Um, right, Dracula is a superhero comic based uh, series published by Dell Comics. Based on three universal, based on the three classic Universal Pictures monsters, the other two titles were Frankenstein and, surprisingly enough, Werewolf. Dracula is a modern-day descendant of the original Count Dracula, and now working as a medical researcher in the old family castle of Transylvania, where, due to his experiments to develop a cure for brain damage using a syrup developed from bat blood, syrup. He, yes, syrup. I mean syrup. Yes. <laughs> the first syrup. First syrup, <laughs> then serum. Then some ice cream, and then there will be cake. Um, yeah. Anyway, developed from bat blood, he accidentally gains a strange vampire, in inverted commas, like powers, including the ability to turn into a bat and a superhuman sight and superhuman sight and hearing. He decides to embark on a superhero career in order to redeem his family name, developing his body through a diet and exercise to the peak of physical perfection and designing himself his own distinctive crimson cowled purple costume with a bat-shaped gold belt buckle which he vows to fight, fight evil and superstition in its, all its forms. Leaving for America after local peasants burned down his castle, however, he adopts the secret identity of Al Ucard. Mm hmm. Uh, his girlfriend and confidant, blonde socialite BBBB, that's B. B. Yeah, no, no, it's actually spelled B and then a B and then it's B double E B E. B B B B. Gains the same powers and becomes his blue-clad sidekick, Fleeter, from Fleedam, Fleedermaus, the German word for bat. Bringing to the team not only a black belt in judo, but also an abandoned, hidden, underground radar installation bomb shelter, which is on her family mountain estate that Dracula uses as his secret laboratory lair. His oath? I pledge by the strange powers which have become mine to fight against injustice, corruption, evil, and greed, which fills the earth in the hope that somehow my example will be an example to all men. That's it. <laughs> that's that's the whole size of it. But it 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 sounds ridiculous. But it becomes even more ridiculous when you actually see what he looks like. Right, Darren, would you care? To uh, describe what you have in front of you. 
please. He looks like somebody's gone for a bad cosplay <laughs> mashup. They're like, what shall I be? Shall I be Batman or shall I be the Phantom? <laughs> and maybe a bit of Judge Dredd thrown in there with the big belt buckle. No, no, I'd throw a bit of Care Bear in there as well, judging by the ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does. It's the it's the weird thing over his nose. What's that all about? What is that? It's like it's like someone's kind of like a, an Anglo-Saxon helmet with the, the nose plate that comes down. <laughs> yeah, it's just bizarre. So, um, yeah, <laughs> not as not not as nearly as impressive as as bat as a Dracula or a man who dresses up as a bat should be. To be honest. No, but I'd have to say, I mean, this surfaced in the late 60s. Yeah. And then um, a similar lycra-clad scientist was mucking about with bat syrup. Sorry, serum. <laughs> all right, all right. Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> and we got Morbius the Living Vampire. That's very true. Oh. And it's kind of, I have wondered, because I'm, I'm familiar with this incarnation of Dracula. <laughs> okay. I have wondered, kind of, well, I wonder if there was a... <laughs> Someone had read this at Marvel and thought, hang on. Yeah, hold on. So Morbius... Uh, 1971, I believe, Morbius first yeah, appears. Yeah, exactly. Hold on. Yeah, he does. <laughs> he appears in October 1971, whereas Dracula, the new Dracula, um, turns up in 1966. Mmm. Mmm. There's a lawsuit waiting to happen. <laughs> Don't forget to cite us, the Black Dog Podcast, in your lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, there you go. He's not. Uh, yeah, go on. You were mentioning a, a person called BBBB. Yes. Uh, his, I googled his that, and yeah. the closest I could find there's there's a Beatrice BB PhD. Um, mm-hmm. She works in America. That's the closest I could get for that. Okay, B B B B. Right. Um, yeah, she's a healthcare professional, apparently. Or, or possibly of a healthcare event, or I don't know. Hold on, comic. This is really enthralling. Man looks up stuff. Um, well, <laughs> that's how it works. That's how it works. To Google. Um, I've, I've got her. <laughs> you've got oh, her. Oh dear me. Oh yeah. Think, think, Miracle Man in a headscarf. Yeah, I'm. Lo- <laughs> Darren, <laughs> take a look at that. <laughs> what the fuck? It's like, yeah, it's like Dale Arden went down the down the shops. You, you know what she looks like? She looks like you know those pictures way back when people used to have sort of, sort of like you know really bad teeth and they used to hurt and they put those bandages around their face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what it looks like. She's got a bad tooth. I was gonna, I was gonna say it looks like Hilda Ogden the early years. <laughs> it's like like she suddenly wanted to be a superhero and when she was a bit younger. Yeah. He looks like he's saying, I have to stand like this, otherwise my trousers fall down. <laughs> <laughs> no, honest, yeah. governor. That's, that's, yeah. Dracula and Fleeta, two dedicated people aware of something evil which abounds in the world. Mm, yet determined I'm aware of something evil. I'm not yeah. sure what it is. No. Yet determined to do something about it. BB BB has proven herself already, <laughs> even before she gained the strange powers of the Dracula. And now, together, they will fight for justice. Dracula in his cave and Fleeter in her father's nearby estate will be ready for whatever threat raises its ugly head. Yeah. How do they get in those costumes, by the way? I can't move. Spray on. Because <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any seams, zips, or any kind of connective tissue. Or connections, or seams, or anything. Why are we standing at the base of a volcano? This doesn't sound very safe. No. Look at look up in the sky. That's what she's doing. She's going, look up in the sky. Look up there. There's some evil. I've got a game for you to play. Can you tell how many fingers I'm holding up behind mm. my back? <laughs> go on, give it a go. Hmm. Anyway, well, that was um, that was a shitty superhero um of sorts. Yes. So thank you very much for that, Doreen. Um. Oh my God. There's another one called Super Guy. Hmm. We'll move on from that, I think. Sorry, just stumbling across image searches. Mm. Yeah. 
let's not do that yet. So anyway, thank you very much for that, Doreen. Uh, shitty superhero. And if anyone else has any shitty superheroes they'd like to inflict upon us all, then do send them into blackdogaggyplanetonline.com. Right. Okay. So I guess, Jim, it's time for you to bring some culture to the podcast. <laughs> yes, indeed. I'll roll that <laughs> jingle once I've found it. <laughs> The Elephant Party Piece Penile Puppetry Diversion An amusing and charming simulacrum of the popular grey-skinned <laughs> umbrella stand footed pachyderm achieved by using a chap's genitive equipment and his pocket linings pulled inside out. <laughs> a great way to break the ice at parties. Or indeed, to get yourself placed on the sex offenders register. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much for that, Jim. Yeah. There was always I always remember seeing I don't know whether it was a chat show or something on late night TV where someone actually stuck their thumb through their fly and did that. <laughs> I can't remember. All I remember is Russell Harty going, ooh. <laughs> Russell Harty. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, showing me age. There you go. Anyway, so thank you very much. That Jim, yes. And uh, if anybody else wants to get 12 pounds of meat out of a fly, let me just, hold on. Uh, no, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> Time to unzip the package. <laughs> Release the beast. Anyway, so I guess we should move on to this week's uh, film. The Elephant Man. Roll the crying jingle. Right, okay, there you go. Um, so, The Elephant Man, okay. A film, unsurprisingly, directed by David Lynch, based on a screenplay by Christopher DeVore, Eric Bergen, and David Lynch, based on The Elephant Man and other reminiscences by Frederick T. Treves, and in part based on The Elephant Man, A Study of Human Dignity by Ashley Montague. It starred Anthony Hopkins, John Hurt, Ang Bancroft, uh, John Gilgood, Wendy Hiller, and was released on October the 10th, 1980. It had a budget of $5 million, and it made at the box office, Darren? Um, $60 million. Right, okay. Jim? Uh, $80 million. Okay. Elton? $12 million. You were closest with 26 million. Oh. So there you go. No, then again, bear in mind, this is 1980, so it's not not super out of the realms of believability. Anyway, so anyway, production. So the film's producer, Jonathan Sanger, optioned the script from writers Christopher DeVore and Eric Bergen after receiving the script from his babysitter. Uh, Sanger had been working with Mel Brooks' his assistant director assistance director on high anxiety and Sanger showed Brooks the script which he read and decided to help finance the film through his new company Brooks Films Brooks personal assistant student Stuart Cornfield suggested David Lynch to Sanger and Sanger met Lynch and they shared the script that they were working on uh, The Elephant Man and Lynch's Ronnie Rocket uh, Lynch also told Sanger that he would love to direct the script after reading it, and Sanger endorsed him after hearing Lynch's ideas. However, Brooks had not heard of David Lynch at the time, and Sanger and Cornfield uh, had to set up a screening of a razor head in a screening room at 20th Century Fox. Brooks watched it, loved it, and enthusiastically let Lynch direct the film. By his own request, Brooks was not credited as executive producer to ensure that the audience would not expect a comedy after seeing his name attached to the film. For his second feature, the studio film, albeit independently financed, David, fin uh, David Lynch uh, furnished a musical direction and sound design, and Lynch also tried to design the makeup himself too, but the design just simply didn't work. 
Lynch referred to that episode as one of his darkest moments of his life. Uh, the makeup, now supervised by Christopher Tucker, was di- directly designed from casts of John Merrick's original bo- originally his body, which had been kept in the London Royal Hospital's private museum. The makeup took seven to eight hours to apply each day and two hours to delicately remove. John Hurt would arrive on set at 5am, shoot his scenes from noon till 10 o'clock at night when uh, when Hurt was having his first experience with the inconveniences of applying makeup and having to perform with it. He called his wife saying, I think they finally managed to make me hate acting. Because of the strain on the actor, he worked alternate days, and Lynch originally wanted Jack Nance for the title character, but he wasn't. But it wasn't on the cards, Lynch said. The role went to John Hurt after Brooks, Lynch, and Sanger saw his performance in The Naked Civil Servant as Quentin Crisp. Uh, Lynch bookended the film with surrealist sequences centred around Merrick's mother and her death. Uh, Lynch used Samuel Barber's adagio for strings to underline the end of the film and Merrick's own death. And when Lynch and Sanger screened The Elephant Man for Brooks they re- after they returned to England with a cut, Brooks suggested some minor cuts but told them that the film would be released how they made it. The film was met with critical acclaim and on Rotten Tomatoes holds a 90% rating based on 41 reviews with an average of 8.4 out of 10. The site consensus reads that David Lynch's relatively straight second feature finds admirable synthesis of compassion and restraint when treating its subject uh, and features outstanding performances by her and Anthony Hopkins. Uh, Vincent can be wrote, uh, Mr. Hurt is truly remarkable and can't be easy. To, it can't be easy to act under such a heavy mask. The physical production is beautiful, especially Freddie Francis's black black and white photography. Uh, Roger Ebert gave it two stars out of four, writing, I kept asking myself what this film was really trying to say about the human condition, as reflected by John Merrick, and I kept drawing blanks. In her book, The Spectacle of Deformity, Freak Shows and Modern British Culture, Nadia Birchback uh, said that the film was more mawkish and moralising than one would expect from a leading postmodern surrealist filmmaker and unashamedly sentimental. She blamed its mawkishness on the use of Treves's memoirs, Treves' memoirs as source material. Uh, the film got eight Academy Awards, um, tying with Raging Ball. Uh, including Best Picture, an actor in a leading role, art direction and costume design, directing, uh, film editing, music score and writing of screenplay. It also got BAFTA for Best Film. And uh, I'll leave it there. So, uh, right. Who hasn't seen this film before? Me. Okay. Uh, I haven't right, actually okay. seen it. I've just seen clips of it. It's like, you know, the Goodfellas. Okie dokie, right, fine. Well, in which case, we'll go to Elton first and find out what he thought of it. So, Elton, what did you think of The Elephant Man? Okay, well, it's not the film I was expecting to see. Really? Uh, Were you expecting elephants? A man bitten by a radioactive elephant. (laughs) There was a... (laughs) And he ran off into the distance. (laughs) With great grey skin comes great responsibility. (laughs) With many buns comes great responsibility. (laughs) <laughs> Go on, carry on. Oh dear. Uh, it, I suppose in my mind I'd built up this film as to be more of a a, a shock horror, scare type movie. Uh, kind of a, a Dick Dastardly or something like that. Someone waving a, a cape over their face and chuckling to themselves and then running off into a, a London night. <laughs> like that's the, that's the way I've built it up in my head from little clips I've seen and... Mm. Just, just over the years where I, I haven't got around to watching it. And okay. it it wasn't that at all. No. It was um I I, I don't know, it, it was it's a totally different beast to what I was expecting. You you can tell or from my point of view, it seems like there was a lot of love put into this. Mm. Where I was expecting shock horror and screams and scares and uh jump scares shall we say it wasn't there it was very restrained in its approach it it treated everything with great care and dignity the way it set itself out it could have yeah. been oh my god here's his face oh my god isn't he terrifying but it it almost went to that and then it it pulled itself back and took a look at itself and then uh presented uh mm. john to you 
Yeah. And it was done in such a lovely style. Um, it, even where it's, it's shot in black and white, I think that's where I was a youngster, and I've seen it in black and white. Naturally, as a youngster, it would turn me off. Mm. And so I never really got around to it. I wasn't expecting it. I was, I was expecting a black and white film. I wasn't expecting a 1980s black and white film. Mm. And it was harking back the way it was filmed, the, way, uh, the style of certain acting specs that were played out in front of you. It was more of like a, a, a 1940s Oliver Twist. And yeah. it was done so well to, to give that interpretation towards you. Yeah. It, I, I think if it was shot in colour, you would have lost a lot of this movie. It really yeah. I, would the the makeup have held up? I, I don't know. Maybe the the black and white hid uh, some of the features and stuff like that. But yeah. it just worked in black and white. I think that was perfect for it. Um, it it wasn't hideous at all. It was it was such a gentle, sweet film once you got into it. And yet, I I didn't find myself crying at it. No, okay. No, I didn't. So I was zero uh, blub. Yeah, nil pois. Um <laughs> It nearly got me because what, what was that song that you said? The, the, Adagio, the very famous Barbara Adagio for strings. Mm. Yeah, as soon as that kicked in, I thought, "Oh, hang on, I know exactly where we're going with this." Yeah, and while I was watching the movie, I, I, it was it was making me more interested in 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 John Merrick. Yeah. And what was going on. So I, I had Wikipedia up and I was just scanning through that. And I, I read about his his death and what was going on around that sort of thing. And then I think if I hadn't read that, then I would have been a bit confused on the ending. Uh, it was mm. a bit open-ended for my liking. But In what respect? I mean, what, just the way he died or what? Okay, well, if I hadn't read the Wikipedia, I... I think I would have maybe cottoned on to him dying, but it wasn't it wasn't so much in your face that he had passed away. It could have been just he wants to sleep like a, a regular person. And that was that is one of his dreams to, to carry out. They do mention and, it though, about if he lays down yeah. then that's it. Mm. He's a goner. Bites does, doesn't he? Um, bites uh, bites so, does, yeah. Treves does as well. Mm. Uh, he's, he's, he's actually mentioned a couple of times and it is sort of it is seeded I mean yeah. it's difficult to say because I mean I knew the story of the Elfin Man before I saw it so <laughs> mm. right um, anyway go and carry on then Elvin. it's Sorry. not that I didn't miss them seeds it was I don't think it was as on the nose for me to say this is the death of that man he has chosen to die going to sleep mm. Um, it, it, if I hadn't read the Wikipedia, then I, I may have not clued in on that. But mm. with the Wikipedia up by my side, read how he did actually die, and then you can see him. It, it's all in the preparation of the bed, and you think, okay, I know exactly where this is going. Fuck, you know, this is getting a mm. bit... It's dark, but it's also sweet at the same time. Yeah. And... Mm. You don't want him to go to sleep. Mm. <laughs> and it, it is so sad. But I like the way that, you know, way people treat him. And he's, he's first, when he's first treated with respect, it's such a shock. And you, you kind of sit in there punching the air going, yeah, go on, that's exactly what I want. It It does really get you feeling about certain things. And... Even about life today, but just certain aspects of life nowadays, you just think, "Oh, come on, you know, really, is there any need for this sort of shit happening now?" But I, I was all there. It just didn't make me cry. I thought it was a beautiful movie. It set itself out very well. The the style worked really, really well. I'm glad they it was black and white. It, as I said before, as a child, I think I was thrown. As, as this could have been an older movie. Um, there, there were f- some funny moments for me. There was a, a bit where um, uh, Anthony Hopkins, he walked in through the door. Uh, and it was like he was pushed in 
by the director. He's like, oh, bang. <laughs> oh, hello. Prod. It was um, John Merrick's first time that he let someone into his house mm. or into, into his uh, bedroom and he knocks and all of a sudden Anthony Hopkins was like, bang, yeah. in there. Yeah. But he played his role very, very well. Mm. The way that he was a doctor foremost mm. and he was he, he had a patient and then it grew into a friendship, you know, bringing him into his house and you you could see them walls breaking down and then he didn't want to show the children and there was a there was another barrier that he had to break down for himself. It was it was played really, really well. Um with John Hurt, you could hear John Hurt behind the mask. All right. I felt you could hear John Hurt. Every, it wasn't every single time. It was just mm. every now and again you could catch his his twang there, mm. uh, and which took me out a little bit. But overall, I thought it was it was full of great villains, great mm. set pieces. It was done beautifully, and a thumbs up from me. Excellent. Okay, cool. So so even if it didn't make you cry, it was certainly a good film for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not going to put it on every year, I don't think. <laughs> not, not a Christmas movie, then. No, no, not, not, no, no, definitely not. Um, this, it's one to break out every, well, I, I don't know, just, you need to be in the mood for this. You need to really think about it and maybe sit down and go, I haven't seen The Elephant Man for a long, long time. I wonder what, how it holds up now. It's not yeah. a, oh, it's been two years since I've seen that. I need to see it now. Yeah. You, you really need to think about it and it needs to play on your mind and then you go to watch it, I, for me anyway. So okay. um, I, I thought it was really, really good. Uh, but no, no blubbing from me, I'm afraid. Okie dokie. Well, maybe we need to work out a blub blubometer. <laughs> from from sort of no blub through dust in the eye to outright I'm sobbing and I don't care <laughs> to oh I've just sneezed or something like that I, I think we'll have to work it out okay, overcast, uh, over- slight showers yeah exactly, stormy weather approaching um, anyway so thank you very much for that Ellen. okay right fine well then we'll move on to you Mr Barnard as the uh, only other person who hasn't seen it before yeah so, so what did you think? Okay, when I, you know, way back when this movie was first pushed out and mm. they were showing various clips of it and mm. what have you, uh, you got the impression it was it was a horror movie. Yeah. Right? It was mm. even the bit where, you know, in the um, in the market where they pull his, how, they pull his mask off mm. and he does the whole, I'm, I'm not an animal, I'm a human being thing. Yeah. There's even yeah. they stop there just as the mask is being pulled off yeah. on the clips they originally yeah. showed, you know, and it's then you hear the audio, yeah, um, including the bit where the nurse slowly works her way up the staircase to mm. take him the food. Even that's done like a horror movie, yeah, in some of the clips we yeah. saw. But um, oh, you pulled oh, my earphones out. I'm pulling the earphones. <laughs> out. Gone deaf. Um, it's, yeah, there you go. It it makes a good point of showing the. Even though John Merrick is the one that's disfigured, it's actually people around him that are the fucking monsters. Yeah, mm. you know, if anything, we've learned, we've we've learned anything from this uh, cast. Mm. Victorians were guns. <laughs> yes, very <laughs> much so. It. Yes, they were, or uh, quite a few of them were anyway. Well, the um, vast majority, I think, we can easily say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right down to Michael Elphick, Bill Sykes type oh, character. Yeah. I mean, e. Jesus Christ. I was hoping that Anthony Hopkins yeah. was going to beat the shit out of him. with Nobody can sack cane. me but mother what's-her-name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <She's> like, <laughs> boom, <laughs> done. Yeah. Sacked. Consider that. A re- yeah. it, it, we should have had, it should have had an Arnold Schwarzenegger sort of, consider this a divorce. Yeah. <laughs> sort of <thing>. yeah, <laughs> Smack. Yeah. So, um, now, what did I think of the film in general? I thought the film was very, very good. Now, the only mm. problem I had was the copy yeah. I was watching yeah. flaked out 10 minutes before the end. No. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to go searching for it. So I found I found the end of it on YouTube. So oh, I started right. watching it there. And then three minutes before the end, it flaked out. I had to go find another copy of it. And this no. one was in German. Yeah. Now it, was, it was a good job. The, there's no dialogue. There's no dialogue 
because it was perfectly it was in HD and everything. So um yeah, it kind of got broke up. So oh. the effect of the end okay was kind of drowned out by me going fuck her now. <laughs> so um so 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 this whole man blood month is a complete failed experiment. Well, it is it's if the technology does not you know, it's not up to snuff. But um yeah. no, I felt you you feel for John Merrick. You you don't want him you don't want to see him hurt, you know. He mm. he's such a lovely lovely person. Mm. And it's all these people just trying to yeah to just destroy him, you know, just to use him for their own means. Yeah. And it's like he's so grateful for any kindness. It's yeah. just at, for at first it's overwhelming to him. Mm. He can't even talk. No. Nah. You know, well, he can, but he just he chooses not to at that point. Well, exactly, because mm. he's still in kind of like denial that mm. you know anybody could actually be kind to him. Yeah. Um. So yeah, this was a this was a fantastic film, mm. beautifully shot. Um, I thought Anthony Hopkins was just great in it. Yeah, as well, really, very much so. And you're really behind him when he... I mean, that whole thing of him when he realises that he's no better mm. after a while than... Um, bites. Bites. Yeah. And then changes his whole mm. thing. And, you know, you are kind of swept up in the whole euphoria when, mm. like, the nurse brings him a gift and mm. says, look, this is for you. Yeah. You know, and it's here's like... Your, here's your cleaning box. Yeah, that, shaving the box, cleaning yeah. box yeah. part there was just a real kind yeah. of, you know, that was that was lovely. Yeah. And you just see the way he's so thrilled by it, this simple yeah. thing, mm. you know. So me, I kind of, I got swept up in that. It was, mm. it was really well done. All props to, you know, John Hurt mm. for his role in it as yeah. well. But um, yeah, I, I'd say this was, a, this was a great film. I think it deserves the acclaim mm. that it gets. Okay. Basically, and it's it's just beautifully shot. Cool. And as Elton says, I think it it works extremely well in black and white. Cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Jim, soon as it's your choice, <coughs> I'll mm-hmm. I'll let you um I'll let you have the final word on this one. Okie dokie. We'll do the final word on every you know everyone will get their final word for their particular choice. Mm. So um yeah for me, uh, this is the second time of watching it. Um, I have to say that this time round with a more because when I saw it, it was quite young, yeah. Um, and just anything dying. I mean, fucking hell! I cried when I watched <laughs> fucking Wildlife on One and watched salmon wash up on a shore. I just, I was just the <laughs> fish, fish. Had a fishy have come to die. <laughs> so yeah, so I was complete wreck with the first time round. Yeah. This time round, I I, I I could appreciate everything else with it. I think Anthony Hopkins' turn is amazing. When you consider that what he's become since, mm. he's a you know just Mister Ham a- H A M actor. Well, I want to see I want to see magic mm. now with him mm. in it. Yeah, and that is now. Oh yes, that's yeah. A me ooh. me too actually because he he's a much more interesting actor in this film. Than he's been since Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, I think yes. Silence of the Lambs just kind of tweet, tweaked him. I think you mentioned that last week, actually, Jim. Do you think he's got a bit Marlon Brando, where it's just like I don't have to try I th- anymore? I th- yeah, I think he just he's just one of those kind of believe your own hype, and you know, one role defines him for the rest of his life. Mm. But um, the the story is still brilliantly told. I mean, apart from Lynch's surreal bits at the beginning and end, which to me. You know, understandable. You know, it's Lynch. He's going to do something, but the whole thing of the woman writhing around on the floor while just elephants look on, kind of slightly bemused, and then some, and then reach reach for a bun off camera. It's just like that bit where she's there and she's just like head yeah. goes from side to side for like five minutes. Yeah, exactly. So I can explain that. Okay, well, cool. That's good. It but, was, uh, um, yeah. It was something in the Elephant Man. I believe it was in the original um, show publicity when it was in the Freak Show. Mm. It was said that his mother had been startled by an elephant, and oh. this was the cause of his deformity. Uh, That's what he's alluding to. It isn't just yeah. um, David Lynch going going off on one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it, 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 it is. Um, it's it's 
it's an allusion to that. Okay, that's cool. Um, that's cool. Um, I mean, so so the one thing that really struck me this time was the attention to detail on, on everything was amazing. Even just down to the little things like the way that they messed around with the gas lights. It just was beautiful. And the black and white really helped it. And, you know, it may cover a multitude of scenes with the makeup, but I thought it was exactly the kind of look it had to have. And I just thought, I thought it was a lovely film. And then as soon as Adagio for Strings kicked off, I, I think I think someone must have been knocked over a bowl of flour. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know quite what it was. I think I think there was some flour in the air. There was there was definitely some pollen, some woodwork going perhaps, on nearby. Perhaps maybe some wood chips mm-hmm. going up. I I I'll be honest with you. I I watched this film in two two stages because I wasn't in the best of best frame of mind yesterday, um, and so. I watched it and I thought, no, no, I've got to just take a sec- second out. And I took a minute out and then I came back. And I came back for the second half, essentially, when Anne Bancroft turns up and then they do the Romeo and Juliet thing, which is a fantastic scene. And then it's like, and she just turns around and she goes, you're Romeo. And it's like, mm. I'm I'm not. I'm <laughs> no, I'm not. I, I'm not going to, no, no. Naughty emotions. Back <laughs> yeah. in the box. But then by the time Adagio kicks off, it was like, oh, fuck. That's it. I'm done. Um, Some of chopping onions in there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I haven't got a lot to add, to be honest. I, I thought I thought it was beautifully shot, beautifully filmed. The the storytelling is, is sparse, but, you know, effective. The acting is just amazing. The The, the look of the thing is beautiful. The, the script is lovely. Um, I see flashback, by the way. Go for it. One of my favourite bits in there mm. is when they're all sat around the table, the thing, and they've you got most of them going, um, "Oh, we've got to chuck him out the the the, the thing." Oh, and the princess mm. turns and, up, and you've got yeah, is it Sir John Gil? Is it yeah, yeah, Sir, Sir John, John Gilgus sitting there going, "Oh, so you want this, do you? Oh, yeah. Really, really? Is that is that what you want? Yeah. Yeah. Tell yeah. us." So, Such uh, a fuck you're you not going to back down yeah. on that ever, yeah. really. <laughs> and then after that, she turns up to sing. It's like I could hear Stewie Griffin's voice going, "So they're chucking him out of the hospital thing. Uh, how's that going for you?" <laughs> exactly. Is that okay? Yeah, is, did you uh, have you got his bed packed? Anything you going on? At all going on there? Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, I, t- I tell you. I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, my, my, my acquaintance with. With Sir John Gilgood as an actor is is kind of like basically it stops at like fucking um, Arthur. Frankly, <laughs> it's it's such a such a gap in my such a gap in my knowledge. But see him in this, yeah, and it was amazing because when you saw him, and then he does that whole thing with the soup, yeah, right at the very beginning, he, he just, knows he it's knows like, right from the off, stupid mate, exactly. But it's it's. It's the kind of storytelling you don't get in films today, where you mm. don't need to say he knows. He just does something which tells the audience, without yeah. telling the audience, that he knows what's going on. Oh, you're going to drink this soup, are you? Well, actually, Matron, why don't you take this up to the person in the quarantine lab, and I'll go and get a... Yeah, it's like, oh, for, <laughs> so nicely done. So well played. Mm. And then when he turns up again, when Bites is threatening... Um, exactly. Anthony Hopkins, it's like, ah, oh, so good. Which which makes it all the worse that that bites, uh, Freddie Jones, is he's a bit too hammy for me. He's the, probably the weakest link in the whole thing. Well, he's kind of a a perfect example of a vaudevillian sort of yeah, performer. I, I, I get you know, it. I get it. The whole thing when but, John uh, with um Anthony Hopkins first comes to see the Elephant Man, and there's only him there. But he still mm. does the full. Yeah, I know, I know. It just, it just, it was compared to everyone else playing everything really low key and really along the level and beautifully nuanced performances. To have him kind of coming in and essentially going wibble every five <laughs> seconds and googling his eyes a little bit, it was like, okay, you, 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 if you just. I was in back. Willow, don't you know? Yes, exactly. He, he does get a bit too twirly moustache towards the end, where he's sloping into rooms. Yeah, exactly. Michael Elphick's character, you know, the 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 janitor, hmm. he's a much more believable evil, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Whereas when he turns up and he's kind of like he is literally when, especially when he gets 
take you take you to the to the room in the hospital, you know, with Michael yeah. Elphick and his other lot. It's just like he he could he pretty much all but does what you were saying, Elton. You know, sort of cape around the nose, going, <laughs> "I'm going to get you when you Penelope pet stop," you know. But um, but apart from that, I love this film. I think it's great. I don't know that I can watch it. I have to be in a right mind to watch it. Yeah. But when I do watch it, love it. And yeah, really well done. Really well made. Probably my most well, my favourite Lynch film, because as much as anything, it's probably the most understandable he's done, apart from a straight story. Um, uh, where the end is concerned, mm. by the way, when mm. he goes to sleep on the bed, yes, there is a question mark hanging over um, as to whether John Merrick actually put the pillows there in that shape himself, or whether something else happened. What do you mean? Well, I was reading up on the history of it. And oh right, the, whether or the not doctor, it's... yeah, it's kind of in they, real life. They, they, yeah, they go ahead in the film and show him as doing it, and I think that's a beautiful little ending. It's like, you know what, I've done it. I'm, mm. I've had, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go now. Well, I mean, you know, at the risk of sort of running roughshod over anything that Jim's going to say or the feedback is, well, the thing I, the thing I got from that was he, he has that one perfect moment, and every time he has a perfect moment someone comes along and fucks it up for him. You know, whether or not he's dancing around the room in his finery and then all of a sudden Michael Elphick turns up and fucks things up. Or whether or not, you know, he's given some nice things by, you know, by um, Anthony Hopkins and Susanna York and then all of a sudden he makes her cry by just being nice. Hmm. You know, he, every time something happens nice, it fucks up because it's someone else fucks it up. And it's almost like he gets the perfect moment. He gets the moment he really enjoys and then he basically thinks, well... That's it now. Yeah. And I just... Oh, is, is it dusty in here? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. You've had a couple of beers. I've had a couple of beers. I really love you, man. Love anyway, you. so... um, Yeah, but for me, total thumbs up. And I'll I'll, I'll leave the floor for Mr. Mister Moon, sir, because it, it was your pick, so away you go. Well, listen, I mean, I first saw this um, <clears throat> in the quite early 80s. This was one of those films everybody wanted to get when the glorious golden age of backstreet video shops dawned and unscrupulous men in grey cardies would happily rent 12-year-olds likes of Hannibal, Cannibal Holocaust and yeah. anything you wanted and no one minded. <laughs> but this is one of these films everybody in our plague I wanted to see, along with Mad Max, um, The Exorcist, Dawn of the Dead... And the Elephant Man, you know, mm. they were kind of your know, must-see titles, you yeah. know. Um, and you know, you know, I remember seeing clips of it on TV, particularly that um, when he's in the mask and cap in the train station. Yeah, and you're thinking, oh, <laughs> yeah. But you know, um, I did actually have did actually have a book about real life monsters, and it had the story of the Elephant Man in. And um, so I knew going in that first time that I wasn't going to be getting a horror film. Mm. But it was, you know, when you're young, it's all about kind of how gross he's going to look. Mm. <laughs> and it is. I mean, uh, to answer a question about the uh, the effects and the use of black and white film, the um, mm. chap who did the makeup for the Elephant Man, memory serves, he did all the horrific radiation um uh, burns and scarring in threads. Oh, if God. you want to see his work in colour, yeah. And uh, he also did the um, all the werewolf effects in Company of Wolves. Um, yeah, Chris Tucker. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> they, I mean, they could have shot it in colour, and it would have looked fantastic. Having, right. having seen his other work, he's um, much underrated in a kind of a forgotten name in the field of practical effects, I think. Very much yeah. overshadowed by his American brethren, but he did bloody good work. Mm. Um, but I think, I think Lynch, choosing to shoot it in black and white, it gives the film this sort of classic, timeless quality. Yeah, And because it is, it has touches of sort of being a fairy tale. It's kind of, it's sort of a film you can put alongside sort of things like um, It's a Wonderful Life. Interesting. You, you know what I mean? That, that kind of, it's a real life story, but there's something um, enchanting about it. Mm. 
if you know what I mean. It's kind of it's not overly fantastic, but the magic's in the emotion. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, and I think that's probably why um, Mel Brooks, when he said, "Well, you mean asked." What's it like working with David Lynch? He says, well, you know, David's fantastic. You just have to realize he's like Jimmy Stewart from Mars. (laughs) (laughs) Which is the best summing up of David Lynch. (laughs) Mm. He is Jimmy Stewart from Mars. Yeah. Um, Now, second time I saw it, and the reason it really got on the man blood month was, um, I think it was towards the end of the 80s, early 90s. Um, Mm. I was at home and it was on TV. I thought, oh, I've watched that again. And I was watching it sort of downstairs on the big telly and mum was in um, knitting and claiming she wasn't watching. And then after half an hour, I noticed the knitting had stopped. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And then it got to the end and she was in tears. And she said, but it is just made up though. I said, no, it's a true story. And then I was off as well. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, And so I've I've only seen, I think, another time in between now and then. Because it is a film you can't put on too often, I don't think. I think it it would ring the magic out over watching it. Mm. Um, watching it this time, it nearly nearly had me in tears several times. And um, mm. I mean, so what gets me, I think, and what makes it so affecting is it's the kindness in the film, mm. not so much the sadness. And I think kind of mm. we don't see much kindness and compassion in movies these days. No. I think that's what makes it so affecting. And the, the beautiful performances um, just really give little things such huge weight. Um, like when he shows you Santa York, the picture of his mother. Mm, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you can, see, you can just see her in her eyes are heartbreaking. As you, yeah. I've tried very hard to be good. <laughs> and oh. oh, God, yeah, that whole thing. <laughs> I, know, I was sad I'm a disappointment to her. Maybe I'll see her again. Oh, oh. Yeah, sorry, carry on. Yeah. Carry on. <laughs> You're a bit dusty in there, isn't it? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, you know, coming back to it now, um, I mean, I can see why he chose Freddie Francis uh, for the cinematography. Um, mm. He is one of the great cinematographers. He, he helms several Hammer horrors, which is it's kind of perfect for this film because Hammer always had this lavish attention to detail mm. and, you know, really worked hard and understood, you know, the value of lighting a set properly and little details. Yeah. And um, I think one of the reasons maybe Winch went with black and white is because Freddie Francis directed, uh, not directed, he did the cinematography for a film called The Innocents, which is a mm. screen adaption of Turn of the Screw, the great ghost story by uh, Henry James. Oh, yeah. And that film is just stunningly shot in black and white. It's mm. eerie and beautiful and uh, you know, Francis just brings that magic to this here again. And I particularly kind of like the way he's kind of, although on one hand he's sort of, Lynch is very cleverly sort of playing with those sort of hammer horror, you know, gaslit streets, Victoriana sort of tropes we all know. Mm. At the same time, he's always shooting it through with little scenes of like, say, pounding machines. And yeah. you get the idea of the, the, so the idea that Victorians weren't this stuffy, kind of society we think them of they were an exciting go-ahead society they were progressive Mm. yeah and it was a new age and it was an age of wonders and exploration and curiosity as well and you have that summed up with kind of that um relationship or sort of mirroring between bites and treves and you know Mm. are they that different yeah well exactly (laughs) is it just different glosses different social classes and Mm. Yeah, or oh, that's that that was one thing that sort of almost never got resolved really, did it? Was he was he really sort of exploiting him in the end or was it actually genuine? Well, so I got the got, got the impression that they did forge a friendship and the fact you have him again a wonderfully underplayed scenes where Susanna York comes downstairs and finds him sat up in the middle of the night brooding mm. about him going actually mm. Um, I, you know, you can tell he's kind of, I didn't mean to be doing that at all. And it's kind of, yeah. but he's really took on board what the head matron has said. And and then, you know, you, I think you do see a shift of where it's kind of, he is about giving John yeah. the best life he can give him. Yeah. Uh, and there is a, I mean, there's a subtle gear change there. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a gorgeous film on just so many levels. And... Um, 
I mean, it has a timeless quality. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter. It could be made in the 40s, the 60s, the 80s. It could have been made 10 years' time. It'd still be the same. And mm. it's just, you know, that's what good filmmaking should do. It should be kind of transcendent and, you know, capture its own story and just bottle it. And it's there, yeah. <laughs> you know. It just takes you out of time for a moment. And I think it is a film that really makes you just, it affects you emotionally. It's a good story, but it does really make you think about, you know, how we treat other people, how we judge other people. and But not in a heavy-handed kind of, I am making a point and you will sit down and you will listen and you will listen to my manifesto on it. Yeah. It's more subtle. It just, you know, it, it goes in through the heart, not through the head. And I think that's a harder trick to pull. Mm. And it, to do it well, you need great subtlety. Because in other people's hands, it could be horribly mawkish and sentimental. Yeah. And some critics have said it's more condition sentimental, but, you know, they've got no soul, so fuck them. Mm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, there is a strain of film critic that, you know, kind of, if anything, you know, actually appeals to people and people like it, it must be bad. <laughs> it's, it's obviously not clever enough. It's not alienating them. Um, and I think, I think there's enough in this film that it is, it is a, an art film. But it is also a classic movie, one you can sit down with your mum and watch and they will mm. be drawn in yeah. because it's just such a well-told story. Mm. And, you know, it's, I think it's one of my favourite Lynch movies and it's kind of, I kind of wish he'd, he'd tell a bit more, a few more straight stories, as it were. Yeah, that's very true because, I mean, for all of his artistic stuff, it's it's which is lovely and, you know, has its place and, you know, things like Mulholland Drive will haunt your dreams for the rest of time but <laughs> you know at the end of the day you know sometimes if a, a good story well told is its own reward it doesn't have to be super arty and, and sort of deep and meaningful with thousands of layers of subtext you know sometimes it can just be a story and be well, quite... the thing is if you tell your story well enough you will get all that stuff yeah where, where so many films go wrong is they start with the manifesto and then try and slather a story on top of it and mm. hope that they're, you know, the manifesto is worthy enough to get them a gong or two. Yeah. But I don't think it works no. in, the, in the main. I think kind of films, films like this is tell a story that just, just really just, just touch on the human experience in many different ways. And many, mm. you know, you can relate to different characters in all sorts of different ways. That, that does the job for you. you. You know, you get that subtext whether you want it or not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, you know, I mean... I probably won't watch it again now for another few years because it's that kind of movie. But it was, you know, it was a real delight just to go back to this. And um, mm. although at first I think, oh my god, what have I signed? What have I? What am I going to put myself through? Yeah, because <laughs> I, I know it, I knew it would tug at my heartstrings. And if anything, as I'm getting older, I'm getting probably a bit more sentimental than mm. <laughs> seeing these, you know, small acts of compassion and kindness do just get me every bloody time. Yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, it's one of those, you know, I, 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 felt, I felt refreshed and better from making this cinematic revisit, which is what you want from going back to a film you've loved in the past. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's very true. I mean, I, like, I, mean I, said, I said it on Facebook myself just before I watched it, which was like, you know, oh, God, I haven't been... I, I'm not quite as apocalyptically depressed as needs to be, but, but actually, when you think about it, this is actually quite an upbeat and hopeful film. Mm-hmm. And quite uh, well, it looks for the best in people, even if they aren't being the best that they can can be. Especially in some some cases, but you know that there is good out there in the world to come and sort of save someone like that, and 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 sort of take him in for you know just for the sake of just being good. Mm-hmm. It's just, the only thing I was gonna. The only thing from that though is it's interesting that, and I know this is. Victorian, you know, time. So obviously, you know, that's playing into a lot of it. But it seemed to me that it was only the people who could afford to be nice were being nice. If you catch my drift, you know, when you were, you know, when you're down in the streets, it's like no one gives a shit. But if you've got like money and funding and princesses and the royalty all sort of supporting you, then you've got the luxury to be nice. Which is which is the only thing that sort of came through a little bit in this time round was that you know these guys are all being nice and well thought out and actually are they are they doing are they necessarily always doing it for the right reasons mm. or are they just doing it because 
it's the thing that they can do. They're in a position to do it. And, you know, circumstances like, as Darren pointed out with the princess, you know, circumstances kind of say, well, actually, you've got you've got no choice now but to be good. And there was kind of, a, to me, it was this little hint of a sort of, yeah, you can be nice, but if circumstances are not going your way, you won't be nice. I don't know if that's a lowly cynical point of view, but it was just to me that was that was the thing. Everyone who was, but then in actually thinking about it, talking myself in circles here now, <laughs> when they were in France, well, I think you see there's a bit of a sea change there of the the the, the people in France aren't impressed with this shtick, yeah, at all, and you know actually you know they don't despise the elephant man, they, they despise bites and his yeah. tawdry show, and then that kind of. Very Gallic gentleman who just gobs and turns away dismissively. Yeah, kind of like it, yeah. it seems that you feel there's a, there's a contrast with those scenes to the earlier ones mm. that maybe things are, are moving on a bit. Of that, uh, yeah. and you get a hint of it actually at the start of the fact that the, the police are trying to close down the freak shows, of saying, "Look, this is this is wrong." <laughs> yeah, actually, that's very true. Mm. That's just, okay, okay, I'll forget all of that stuff before. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I know there is an el- there is an el- there is elements of that in it. I mean, particularly with some of the people who come to visit who are doing mm. it because it's the done thing to do. Yeah, and you know, like um, you know, uh, Anne Bancroft, the actress, you know, gives him a portrait, and then all these other people give him, they give him a portrait as well because yeah. they're, they're they're following her trend rather than yeah. being genuinely altruistic in most cases. Yeah. He's a Pokemon Go of his time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Elton. Thank, thank, that, thank, thank you so much. Uh, um, okay. Well, has anyone got anything else to add, or shall we move on to the uh, feedback? Let's go with the feedback. Yeah, let's go to feedback. Yeah, let's go to feedback. Okay, let's roll the feedback. <laughs> Now put your hands up, here online, doing real fine, we're doing our podcast thing. It's called Black Dog, it's not like a job, is anyone there listening? What do you think of our show? Let us know by mp3 or email, just get it to us, it ain't no fuss, we'll even read your Twitter rings. Cause if you like us or you hate us, it's a feedback in, got a geek who points your rings and puts a feedback in, even think my voice is sexy, puts a feedback in, man, we really like it. Right, okay, so feedback time, and the first bit of feedback comes from Doreen Kelly, and Doreen writes, Hi. I thought I'd seen this before, when I was really quite young. But after watching it again, I'm not all that sure. Perhaps I'd only seen clips, like Elton. The beginning was much more unsettling, atmospheric and creepy than I expected. The black and white added all the period uh, added to all the period touches, like the gas lights, to effectively evoke Victorian London. Somehow the black and white managed to make the high society seems, scenes seem even more classy. But the slums more scary. I half expected Jack the Ripper to come round the corner at one point. The story about John Merrick's mother being struck down by an elephant at the four months into her pregnancy stood out for me, though. At the, at the time, the story sounded a bit stupid, like something made up by an, by the ignorant to scare the uneducated. And I don't mean that in a sno- as snobby as it sounds. But there was some stuff later on after Anthony Hopkins took John into care that made me wonder if he might have been a kernel of truth to it. In a line of dialogue, Anthony Hopkins was haunting, uh, might that be the right word, I pray to God he's an idiot. Um, the sideshow man was detestable, and the scenes where he was beating John Merrick when he was drunk were extremely disturbing. It wasn't even as, as though the sh- scenes showed any extreme violence. Um, when the doctor shows how sick John is, though, Anthony Hopkins can't believe Merrick isn't lying down. But the sideshow man says that John's head is too big and it'll kill him as he lies down. It's amazing how a, this, how a big part of this simple action plays the story. Um, it seemed like a good message about having empathy with the disabled. 
Um, I like the parallels drawn, drawn with the hunchback, hunchback of Notre Dame by having the ringing church bells, and it made me a little uneasy that John's reciting the insi- entire psalm was what saved him from being an incur- sent to an incurables hospital. What a what the heck? The entire question about how John Merrick with his disfigurement could interact with society without becoming an attraction was interesting, but weirdly unsettling. The theatre actress seemed very genuine, though. The standing ovation Merrick received in the theatre was an extremely emotional bit, mostly in a good way, but it also seemed a bit two-faced. A very nearly, I very nearly lost it when the adagio for strings was gently playing as John signed his, um, signed his amazing model and slowly removes the pillows from the bed. The adagio then swells and he lays down horizontal to take control of his own death. However, the voice of Tennyson's poem did not affect me in the same way, so I thankfully regained control. Many thanks, Doreen. Well, thank you very much for that, Doreen. Yeah. Well, there you go. We're off. We're off in the flyer. So it didn't, didn't, didn't strike, didn't bring the old tears up just straight away. But uh, Doreen seemed, Doreen liked it. And um, yeah, thank you very much for that. So, Darren. Yes. Yes. I should just reach over and pull out your phone. Pull out your phone, and we'll have a piece of feedback from you, sir. Okay, and we have um, we have Scott Morrison. Scott Morrison, the uh, the alternate is it alternate or anti profanabard <laughs> The mirror universe the profanabard Mirror universe profanabard That's the pointy it. beard. <clears throat> That's it. Yeah. Um, and he's uh, male is titled. I mean it, Lynch. No Lovecraft for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he he writes, "Hello, Black Doggers." So, now we're on the Elephant Man, or as I like to call it, Old People Being Awesome. Like Lee, I've only seen this movie once many years ago. It had many more fist-pumping moments than I remember, all involving elderly people. <laughs> How can you not love Mother Shed, or Mother Said, smashing mm. the night pour over the head, or cheer when Carl Goldman tells Bites to go piss up a rope? <laughs> Speaking of Gom... John, uh, John Gilgan was apparently one of J.K. Rowling's inspirations for Dumbledore. Can mm. you imagine how good he would have been in the Harry Potter movies? I kept thinking of it during the hospital board scene, especially seeing his cute little cat-like smile when he drops the Queen Victoria new column. Mm. Yes, get it. Yeah. I believe Robert Ebert, Roger, uh, sorry, Roger Ebert once said that if given the choice between watching only colour films or only black and white films for the rest of his life, he would choose black and white. The Elephant Man has to be um, Exhibit A in support of that choice. Mm. Also uh, has the now standard David Lynch technique of pulling a low-pitched rumble into the soundtrack during moments of dread. Mm. Surprisingly, the rest of the movie is free of Lynchian weirdness. There are abnormal people aplenty, but all of them are portrayed as people first. The physical strangeness is shown, as a matter of fact, with no leering. The only other movie of Lynch's that stays as normal is The Straight Story, which I highly recommend. Mm. After watching this, I almost wish Anthony Hopkins hadn't done Hannibal. I think the role of Lecter took him down a path of big, expansive roles. He's so much better when he's reserved and, dare I say, British. I also wish he could somehow preserve John Hurt for future generations, we need him around for a few more centuries of awesome acting. Maybe we could dip him in lacquer or something. Mm. I didn't quite blub, but boy, it got awfully dusty in here during a couple of scenes. <laughs> the first is when Merrick begins reciting the rest of the 23rd Psalm to Treves and Gom. The second is after Merrick's return when he absolves Treves of any guilt and calls him friend. Damn it, it's getting dusty in here again. Just thinking about it. Mm. I also hope David Lynch never, ever, ever does a movie adaptation of Lovecraft. <laughs> Just the thought of it makes me want to go hide in a corner. Anybody who's seen a razor head knows what I'm talking about. Mm. Thanks again for a great podcast. Next week's movie, Silent Running, is a mystery monocle for me. I've heard a lot about it, but never seen it. Regards, Scott Morrison. Thank you very much for that, Scott. Um, yeah, that's the second time I can't remember who else brought it up, but about this the soundtrack that sort of mm. it is quite interesting. That or actually, yeah, it was Doreen. What am I talking about? It's the feedback before with the bloody bells. What am I talking about? <laughs> bloody idiot. Sorry. <sighs> what a day. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, the soundtrack is really interesting insofar as it's just 
it's really kind of ominous and pounding and weird and it's kind of like as as Merrick gets better and more ingrained in society it kind of all that goes away even when he's in his room you stop hearing the tick tock of the of the clock it's interesting anyway well thank you very much that scott and um sorry if your house was a little dusty sir um <laughs> There's a lot of it around this season <laughs> yeah it's definitely it's definitely the pollen it's the pollen in this horrible hot and humid weather anyway so thank you very much that sir good feedback and uh we'll speak to you again next week so um on to you jim who do you have next uh next we have mr greg bones madden ah bones go for it what's the right subject line i'm not an animal i'm a feedbacker Mm. (laughs) go for it anyhow greg writes greetings lee darren jim elton and mr (laughs) al This week, we kick off the man blood month with the elephant man. Shut up. <laughs> he, he's, always, he's always trying to muscle in. Jim, you've got to take a strap, strap to him. Go bites on his arse. <laughs> Anyhow, that avian fiend has been caged again. First, I'd like to say I was surprised to find out that this was not a movie about my childhood and just maybe I was having flashbacks of when my brother tried to make me, make me wear a burlap sack over my head. I must remember to punish him again for that. <laughs> ah, brothers, aren't they so great? <laughs> oh, well, on to the show. For me, this movie would have to be considered a mystery monocle, although I could have sworn I'd seen it before, but if I did, I was either way too young to remember it or I'd just seen clips from it. Strange. That's a lot of feedback as saying this. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Some strange voodoo with this movie. Yeah. Anyhow, Greg continues. Anyways, this movie was a hard movie for me to watch. As being a young lad, I had a lot of experience with working with and around the mentally and physically handicapped during my school years. Although none of them were as nearly as bad as condition as John Merrick was during his time, I saw firsthand how people, mainly kids, <laughs> treated these people. Although we are over 150 years past when he lived, these unfortunate souls are still treated poorly by many of their peers for the most part. I'm not saying it hasn't got better, but let's face it, people tend to pick on those who are different from the norm. Mm. So the show was a hard watch for me, and as a matter of fact, I had to take it in small doses of watching about 20 minutes of it at a time. The movie itself is great, I have to say, and I love that the cinematography in this movie made me truly think of those classic Universal Pictures horror movies. Hmm. I would have not have been surprised if we later ran into the Wolfman or Frankenstein in this movie. And I actually had to check to make sure that this show, when this show was actually made, because I actually felt like it was made in the 40s or the 50s. Hmm. The acting in it was good, and I really felt that I would enjoy this movie if it wasn't <clears throat> for its depressing subject matter. Overall, I have no complaints about the show, although it would not be something I'd watch again, for it was too depressing for me to enjoy. All in all, I really don't have much more to say. I feel like I've droned on long enough. So I'll wrap this up from the medical base of the USSS Black Dog with one last thought. I survived the first week of Man Blood Month. Wishing you all a great week to come and hope and looking forward to our next instalment, Silent Running. Cheers, Greg Bones Madden. I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Greg. Yeah, good feedback, sir. Um, yeah, it's not not a lot to say about that. I mean, I mean, it is, you know, working, you know, working with uh, and being around disabled people and seeing how they get treated, you know, by children is, yeah, not great. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting in some ways, it's like how little we've changed in like a hundred years <laughs> when you think about it, or think mm. about it. But, um, as far as the, the, the universal hammer horror, you know, the movie pictures look, I have to say it was kind of one of those things when, as soon as I saw Brooks films come up, I actually thought I'd put on young Frankenstein <laughs> the first time when I first clicked on it, I was like. Hold on, have I have I clicked the wrong fi- clicked the wrong film? Yeah. 
But it's it is a very striking look. It's very well done. Anyway, um, thank you very much for that, sir. Um, yes, and uh, you know we we'll have a word. We'll have a look with uh, have a word with um, Mr. Spock and tell him not to stick burlap bags on your head. It's not good. Anyway, so uh, naughty, Mr. Spock. Naughty, Mr. Spock. So that anyway. is not logical. <laughs> yeah, not a burlap bag. <laughs> Use a plastic bag. It's much more effective. No, anyway. You're not allowed to play the Pong Far card either. That's weird. <laughs> That's, yeah, that'd just be strange. <laughs> That's just wrong. <laughs> All manner of wrong. <laughs> anyway, right. Moving swiftly on from that one. Um, Elton. Okay, I have the fiendish Dr. Will. Aha. Uh-huh. And... and his subject is, Only Mother's Head Can Sack Me Now. Whack! <laughs> nice. <laughs> Evening all. The Elephant Man was a most remarkable film. Beautiful, beautifully made and with some phenom- phenomenal acting. John mm. Hurt, of course, was amazing. But I love all the other performances as well. The very young Hopkins, the surprising accept the surprisingly accepting Gilgord, and Gilgood. the completely sublime Boone, uh, Hillier's stand for what it's right. Hmm. There were a few scenes that I didn't think were particularly well done. The very Lynchian opening and closing sequences, the dream sequence didn't look particularly good, although it's largely to do with the 1980s technology, I suspect. And two old ladies fighting in the hospital foyer looked like something out of Monty Python. Mm. But that's uh, more than offset by the beautiful... uh, Sorry. But that's more than offset by the beauty of the Romeo and Juliet scene and his bittersweet final moments. You know exactly what's going on, uh, what's going to happen as soon as uh, Barber's adagio for strings kicks in. Mm. That piece of music alone is enough to make anyone cry, let alone coupled with the moving film like this. Having said that, what, watching it while sat outside in a sunny park at lunchtime is not exactly getting into the appropriate mood. So it wasn't quite the man blob film on this occasion, but it should have been. Ultimately, I found this an uplifting film. The fact that Merrick was able to find peace and happiness despite everything made it a, pos- a positive film overall. Although we are left with the fact that Trev's, is it Trev's? Treves. Sorry, Treves never really finds an answer to his aunt's, uh, question of whether he is using Merrick as much as bites. Clearly, Merrick was happier with Treves but it still raises questions about about the nature of relationships and how much we use people for our own benefit or the need to be seen doing good rather than out of pure sense of love and respect. Anywho, that was my thought for the day. Till next time, fiendish Dr. Will. P.S. Yes, that was Pauline Quirk. (laughs) As one of the hookers at the end. It was, yes. Yeah, it was, yeah. 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 I, I didn't realise that was porn in quote until I looked through the the uh, IMDb. Mm. Uh, also, the kid is Dexter Fletcher. Yes, yeah. yes, De- yeah, Dexter Fletcher. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say the one thing I that that he's, that old fiendish Doctor Will there's got re- got right was um, that really random aside with the two women fighting in the middle of the hospital. That just that was just like that was fucking weird. That was yeah. It was it was very Monty Python. It's like oh yeah. We the women's <laughs> Dis- women club do camp on Blood Island. <laughs> exactly. The women's institute do the um do a recre do a historical recreation of the Battle of Pearl Harbor. Yeah, I if that was bites paying them off. <laughs> yeah, that was just that was just a bit weird. That one. Go there, do some weird shit. Mm. I felt there was a meaning for that scene though. Really? Yeah, as as if to say. Because uh, it was Bites that was walking in on that scene, wasn't it? And he was kind of twiddling his moustache and walking <clears throat> dastardly through that field of of, of manic mm. going on. And it felt as if his life had lost that kind of manic mm. uh, whatever was going on. And he was he was trying to find his own, um, I don't know, source of uh, manic in his life. It, it just felt 
it, it worked. That scene worked because it, it was two batshit crazy ladies having to go at each other. Were they from the fair at all? No, I don't think so. Because we never really got to see any women from the fair, <gasps> apart from the bearded one. Um, but one of them looked really, really crazy. Yeah. <laughs> They were and probably I, off I, their nuts. I felt it had, there was a meaning to that scene. I just can't quite put my finger on it. Oh, I'm sure there's a BFI book on the whole on the whole film, which will probably explain that in massive detail and probably link it back to penises somehow. Ah, uh, yeah. If you if you read the BFI book on um, Alien, it's um it's um it's like someone just wrote penis seven hundred times and then just decided to put the word alien in there just for good measure. <laughs> So they have something to put on the book cover. Um, okay, well, anyway, thank you very much for that, Dr. Will. Good feedback. Thank you, Elton. And um, so our last bit of written feedback is from Gary, Mr. Spock Madden, who, when he's not putting burlap bags on his um, brother's head, <laughs> um, write, writes this. Well, what do you mean a man is an animal? What do you mean a man is an animal? The only way to combat Man Blood Month is with limericks. So here is my feedback in rhyme. <coughs> Excuse me. Man Blubbing Month has come, with movies depressing and glum. The first one's from Jim's, will my eyes start to brim, or will I just sit on my bum? Tony's talent Tony's talent won't cease, old Doc Treves is, has a lease. But when it is time to utter the line... To put lotion on, Clarice. Poor old, poor old John Hurt seems cursed. I'm really not. I'm really not sure which one is worse: to have a forehead the size of size of a flatbed, or to exit stage with a chest burst. Workers from Metropolis clipped. Fritz Lang in the cemetery flipped. Shelley is referenced. Hunchback is defense deferenced, and it feels like a homaging rip. In the end, it. I just didn't feel it. It's a deal, and I just couldn't. The film, the film couldn't seal it. The premise was fine, but it, though it's far from sublime, I won't ever want to re-see it. A piece of advice, advice I advance when roaming with Congo, with the Congo perchance, a woman with child should never be riled. You should best keep your trunk in your pants. I think I might have fucked that last bit up. Live long, and circus freaks are people too. Gary, Mister Spock, Madden. Well, thank you very much for that, sir, for a very creative feedback. Um, I shame I just didn't do it the justice. Um, the, the Shelley, the, the the Frankenstein thing. I thought it was going that way when he knocked over the girl at the um, train station. I, I thought it was going to be. Uh, that's actually an echo of um, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. Yeah, because um, that's one of the things Hyde does. He uh, stomps a passerby. Ah, see, I just thought it was going to be like he, you know, he he accidentally kills a child, and then basically the mob goes after him. But um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, that that's it. I thought it was going that way at one point, but yeah, you know, the Hunchback of Notre Dame thing completely passed me by with the blooming bells and clock towers. I should have bloody realised that a lot earlier on, and everyone else got it but me. So uh, hey ho. There's a there's a job going in this in this the, the <laughs> first chair. Well, it, it passed me. I, I spotted it this time, but it passed me by on other viewings. Mm. But that's many. Yeah, you know, I knew the real elephant man. He did build these beautiful cardboard replicas and models. Mm. So I just oh, thought it's just it's just that. Yeah, but there is the hunchback to it as well. So right, okay. Well, thank you very much for that, Gary. Um, that was the last bit of written feedback so now it's time to go to our mp3 feedback and that is Drew and Tracy and let's hear what they have to say about the elephant man so we kicked off the first of the four man weeks of man blub yeah. um, and whilst I was watching this I kind of thought mm, I'm not quite sure this is a blub movie we've just finished it and I feel pretty fucking depressed I know when when it started, you really made me laugh because within the first thirty seconds, with the, his mum and the elephant, what did you say? Well, because I've not no, seen oh it. No. What did you say? <laughs> I said, "Is David Lynch trying to imply that he's called the Elephant Man because his mum had sex with an elephant?" 
The way and, uh, she I was diving around on the floor in Perth. Oh, I nearly spat out my drink when you said that. And and then, and I was laughing so much, and you went, oh, no, 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 no. And then you went, oh, no, she got raped by elephants. <laughs> and we was all really laughing and jolly. But that didn't last long. No, it didn't. No, no, I feel pretty fucking stupid now. <laughs> Uh, no, there wasn't many laughs in that at all, no, was there? No, there wasn't. Oh. Um, but yeah, I have to say in my defence, I hadn't seen this Fair enough. film before. And you didn't know anything about it. And I didn't know, I didn't know right, the reason. Yeah. And obviously they explained it pretty quickly yes. into the film. So, yeah, but my interpretation, she's writhing around on the floor. And we, oh, we don't need to that anymore. You know, yeah. so, hang on a minute, I'm clicking what's going on here. Yes, I I thought that was a wonderful film, actually. I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's obviously painfully sad and... And depressing, but I really enjoyed it. It is. What I mean, did you think? Yeah, no, I thought it was it was really emotional. Yeah, I thought it was it was lovely. It's and very it, draining. It is, and for a David Lynch film, I mean, you can tell it's a David Lynch yes. film because of the bleeding industrial noise. It was going into a bit of a razor head Continually going through it, but for it, him, yeah. I thought that was really quite straightforward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah a lot of good actors in there and I thought yeah. I think it was a really nice story. I I can't really find any fault with it I, I don't know if it's the kind of film I'd really want to watch again but I really enjoyed the experience of watching I it I don't think I've got the emotional stamina no. to watch it again and now you know what's going to happen you know I just think no but there was a couple of things that did kind of make me laugh throughout it we did we did really talk about, well when they had the freak show right oh yeah and yeah. that's very you know freak show really and I said to you, you know, there's a bearded lady sitting there. And I'm like, well, nowadays, that's just a woman going through her menopause who can't be bothered to go and have her beard waxed, to be fair. And the strong man is the <laughs> bloke you see down the pub on a Friday night, isn't it? With the yeah. tattoos and the muscles. So that did kind of give a little bit of humour to it. But... I, did, I didn't find anything in this No, fight, well, but... I was just, you know, you've got to find humour where you can when it's this bleak, to yeah. be fair. No, I'm very enjoyable, I'd say. Yeah. Um... We're going to go and watch Ghostbusters now. I think yep. we need it. Yeah, I need some cheering up yeah. after that. Oh, might cry. All right, well, let's have the next one then. Yep, we're all really looking forward to next no, week. Really? <laughs> all right, catch you later. Bye. Bye. The elephant raped the mum. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Always one. <laughs> one. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Drew and Tracy. That's, that was good. Thank you. That, that 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 brightened the day up, <laughs> and, and the strong man. What's so special about him? He's just down the pub. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Anyway, thank you very much for that, guys. Good feedback, and uh, that's that. Yes, all wrapped up and ready to go. So it just leaves us to tell you what our next film is. Well, obviously, um, I think Gary and Greg. And a couple of others have dropped that in the uh, in the feedback. But um, the second of our Man Blood Month is Darren's choice. Isn't it, Darren? Yeah. There it is. And before we go any further, this is not the... T- well, it is the title of a Mike and the Mechanics song, but we're not reviewing that. No, we're not doing Can You Hear Me? Can no. You Hear Me Running? No. So, so go on and tell them what it is. Okay. Um, it is a... It's an ecological sci-fi film. From 1972. 1972, yes. Starring Bruce Dern. Yes. And three little chaps by the name of Huey, Dewey and Louie. Oh, Louie! Stop it. (laughs) Um, uh, The (laughs) film is called Silent Running. Mmm, Silent Running, yes. Now, come on. Okay, admit it, Mr. Barnard, before I go round to the other two. Have you blubbed at this film? Um, I think I was choked up. And it's and it's all because of how everything just winds up. I mean, there is there is a particular yep. scene don't, involving. Yeah, don't spoil it. Don't spoil it because this is so old. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people have seen this. No, there there is there's pretty sort of. <gasps> no. <laughs> yeah. Shot line. Shot. 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 Okay. Fair enough. Well, in which case, so um, we're moving on. Then, so Jim Elton, have you seen this film? Yes, I, I've seen this a few times. Um, <laughs> I first saw it. Um, the BBC had a series of sci-fi films on. Yeah, I remember. I caught that. it when I was quite young. Um, I just thought it was just an amazing film. It was only when I watched it when I was quite older that I really actually got the 
like ecological themes and it had the, the emotional impact on me. Like, mm. Oh my god! What is... <laughs> yeah, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okie dokie. And 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 was was there some dust in the air in the Shez Shez Moon? It's been been just a few times when I watched this movie over the years. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That's that's fine. You know, I was, I was going to say, was it just a sprinkling of dust or was it a full on cloud of flour in the air? Uh, cloud of flour once, definitely. Oh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. And um, what about you, Elton? Uh, yes, I have seen this a couple of times, and I cried like a waterfall. <laughs> <laughs> I really did, but I was I was quite young, so yeah. I'm I'm a big brave boy nowadays. So um, <laughs> I, I should be strong enough to to get through this. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I I saw this I saw this when I was quite young as well, but I did see it as part of that same thing on BBC Two because it was that Dark Star, mm, yes. and I think it mm. was uh, oh god, I'm trying to uh, War of the Worlds, George Powell War of mm. the Worlds, and I think it was the Forbin Project or Forbin the Colossus. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, which which is a great film. We should do Mad Computer Season. Uh, Forbin and um, then also Demon Seed and a couple of others. Demon like Seed, Rapey Robot. Rapey yeah. Robot, yeah. Anyway. Oh, what's the. Um, oh, Celis. Not Celis. Hmm? Phase oh. 5, that one as well. No, no the Running ro- the Runner or something, Running Robots. Oh. Kirsty Alley and Tom Selleck. Run, run Away. Run Away. Run away. Fuck, the- man, that's a bit of a, a low wow. brow film, that one. <laughs> <laughs> compared uh, to the other ones. No, I mentioned. loved it. I love Runaway. Like, it's a real that guilty pleasure. That scared the shit Simmons. out of me. Yeah. Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons with his heat-seeking <laughs> bullets. Can't go wrong me, with him. I'm a bad guy, but go to kids.com. <laughs> yeah. Buy the t-shirt. <laughs> anyway, off the, off, off the beaten track, I feel a little bit. But, um, yeah, no, I, I saw, um, yeah, I saw this and I, I, I wept like basically my pet had died. I, 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 I was a complete and utter gibbering wreck for after seeing this. I see it once more um, oh, when I was in my twenties, and I didn't get all the way through to the end because I knew how it was going to end. So I switched off the telly before I got to it. <laughs> but I remember it feeling it was a little bit dated. But I mm. don't know now. We're going to see. So there you go. So if you would like to watch, take part in, and send in feedback about um, silent running, Douglas Trumbull doing his wonderful special effects, and um, yeah, then do send your feedback in to blackdog at geekplanetonline dot com, and do join us on our Facebook group, which is facebook dot com slash groups slash the Black Dog Podcast, and if you get a chance, stick a stick a review on the, on iTunes that'd be lovely and um yeah oh and don't forget once again September the 10th Black Dog Shindig indeed Black Dog Shindig I keep meaning to say this right at the beginning because I'm pretty sure people drop off by the end but <laughs> remember Black Just Dog like Shindig a good Agatha Christie uh, mystery <laughs> exactly and then there were two but Black, Black Dog Shindig 2016. Indeed. Come the, along. Ship and, the Ship and Shovel going around the pub, just having a drink. You're all invited. You can find the event on the Facebook group. And all four of us will be there, for what it's worth. Because <laughs> yep. I'll, I'll usually bail, bail a little bit early because I usually get too drunk quick. <laughs> but anyway, so um, before we go, uh, Jim, would you like to tout your wares? Yes, you can hear me every week on my own podcast, Hypnagoria, which you can find on iTunes and Stitcher and, of course, at Geek Planet Online. Episode that just dropped is a commentary for 70s road movie Satanists on Wheels film, Race with the Devil, starring Peter Fonda and Warren Oates. And uh, episode coming up this weekend is another Tomagoria, this time on Dan Simmons' Summer of Night. Nice. Oh, such a good, oh, so good. <laughs> Love it. Anyway, um, right. Well, I'll be looking forward to that one. Um, Elton. Hello. Um, what am I doing? On Thursday, this Thursday coming, the 21st, mm. uh, I am going live on Shonky Lab 
and we are talking about the solar system. I will be joined by Lee Harvey and Andy Plastides. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll be talking about all the planets in the solar system, and we will be giving away planets in the chat room, which is at mixler.com forward slash rogue to media. Oh, can I can I put in an order for early? No, you have to turn up. Balls. Them's the rules, I'm afraid. What's, what's the what's the point of having sort of having this kind of relationship where I can sort of call upon nepotism? <laughs> well, if you know, if you're not going to indulge me, Fucking them's hell. the rules, I'm afraid. All oh, right, so uh, so now this, this that's how it is, is it? This, them's the rules. That's 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 how it works. That's how it yeah. works. I, I'm asking for a favour, a favour from one work colleague to another, and you're going to blow me out live on air. Okay, if if I was, which I'm not, but if I was going to do this favour, what would you choose? I choose, um, actually I don't know, I wasn't expecting you to say yes, but I'll have Mercury. Mercury, okay. Yeah. But them's the rules, so I'm afraid yeah. I can't give you that yet. I like I like anything where the uh, year, the days are shorter than, shorter than a year, uh, longer than a year. Yes, they are, they're... Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to it now. I already know that. Powder dry, powder dry. Anyway, all right then. Well then, um, where can we find you on that? Where's the Mixler address? Uh, it's mixler. dot com forward slash rogue two media. We'll be going live. There's a, a chat room there. You can join in. You can even Skype in if you wish. And uh, once that's all done, the podcast will be up on iTunes and shonkylab. dot com. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, that's it for us this week. So thank you all for listening. Thank you for the feedback. Um, Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Elton. And um, yes, we'll see you all next week for Three Little Robots and a Space Hippie, um, (laughs) which is what it should be called. Um, And until then, see you all soon. Take care. Tatty, bye. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Ta-da. to it.